I would like to uh, join the other speakers in uh, thanking the organizers for putting together such a wonderful conference and for asking me to review some recent progress in our understanding of renormalization group flows in quantum field theory. So I'll start with a few uh, basic comments about the degrees of freedom in quantum mechanics. In a finite quantum mechanical system, there are many different well-defined ways of quantifying how many degrees of freedom you have. Some of them are very intuitive. For example, you could count the number of arguments of the wave function, and in a finite system, that's some finite number n. So there are a few pictures here demonstrating that if you have n particles, then uh, the wave function has n vector arguments. If you have a spin chain of length n, then the wave function again has n slots. And, uh, and that number n is half the dimension of any classical phase space that underlies the quantization. You could also look at the, the dimension of the Hilbert space, which is the same as the infinite temperature limit of the partition function. And uh, I'll get back to this later in the talk, but you could also use different measures of quantum entanglement. So this is very basic. And when we transition from quantum mechanics to quantum field theory, it is often useful to think about the continuum quantum field theories as arising uh, as a limit of finite systems with a short distance or UV cutoff. And here I call the cutoff epsilon in distance units. We'll later switch to an uh, energy cutoff. Uh, and of course, in continuum quantum field theory, we're interested in the physical properties of the long distance theory, which are universal, and we're not interested in short distance cutoff artifacts, which we generally refer to as scheme dependent. And uh, all the simple, naive ways of counting degrees of freedom in finite systems that I briefly reviewed on the previous slide uh, diverge in the continuum limit when you take epsilon to zero. So they're not useful in that limit. And uh, what this tells you is that um, you have infinitely many short distance degrees of freedom, and most of them are uh, cutoff artifacts. They're short distance modes, they're not universal. Uh, and they're not excited when you study uh, low energy continuum processes. So to the extent possible, we would like to forget about them in discussing the continuum theory, and uh, this turns out to be a useful and powerful idea. So the formalization of this idea is encoded in the renormalization group flow, and the renormalization group organizes the dynamics of a continuum quantum field theory by energy scale, and uh, it's often useful to imagine that the cutoff is still floating around at high energy, so here I call the energy cutoff lambda. It's related to the distance cutoff like that. And we're going to uh, look at the flow below that energy cutoff. And what we mean, loosely speaking, by renormalization group flow is uh, tracking the evolution of the theory from the ultraviolet to the infrared. And in a slightly more precise sense, we can think of that flow as taking place on the space of all uh, coupling constants, g sub i, of the theory. And uh, even more loosely, we can think of the space of all couplings of all possible theories as a theory space, so the space of all well-defined quantum field theories. Um, so a cartoon picture of what such a flow looks like is down here on the lower left. Uh, you have some coupling constants here on the axes, and the flow tracks out some path in coupling constant space. Uh, the flow uh, doesn't go past a certain point in the UV, which, which is where the UV cutoff sets, but it ends up here at some finite point in the infrared. And um, uh, sometimes it's possible to remove the ultraviolet cutoff by taking it to infinity. And in that case, we get a continuum field theory at all distance scales. Uh, and that means that the renormalization group flow explores arbitrarily high energies. Uh, and therefore, there's a well-defined limit also here at the other end in the UV. And this is what we mean by a UV complete quantum field theory. And uh, encoded, uh, or, or, in, or sort of um, hardwired into all of this uh, intuition and pictures is the idea that along the flow, heavy degrees of freedom decouple from the long distance physics. And uh, what we usually say is that they're being integrated out. So one of the things we would like to do, among many other things, is to understand if anything good and special happens 
uh, at the endpoints of the flow. So definitely we can always explore the zero energy limit, the low energy limit. And if the theory is UV complete, we might also ask questions about the uh, high energy limit. And in both limits, uh, we expect all other mass scales in the problem, which are important at intermediate uh, energies, to decouple there. And we expect the theory to have some emergent symmetry, which is uh, scale symmetry. So we expect the endpoints of our G-flow to be scale invariant. And in principle, there are many different scale invariant trajectories that you could imagine uh, taking place at the asymptotics of the RG flow. Uh, down here, I've repeated the picture from the previous slide, which is the most familiar one, where you have both a UV fixed point and an infrared fixed point. But for example, you could imagine other scale invariant asymptotics, such as limit cycles, and even more uh, exotic ones, like ergodic or turbulent scale invariant asymptotics. Uh, I didn't want to draw these, but um, they're all mentioned and discussed as possibilities in the classic review on the renormalization group by Kogut and Wilson. And uh, as I said, fixed points are the most familiar asymptotics, but uh, we would like to understand whether the others can also be realized or perhaps excluded. And what happens under favorable conditions is that the asymptotic scale symmetry in the deep UV or the deep IR is even further enhanced to the full conformal group SOD, comma 2 in D space-time dimensions. And uh, this happens very often in many examples that we study, but we would like to understand when it happens precisely and whether we can use it to uh, obtain new constraints on the renormalization group flow. Of course, we're very familiar with the idea that uh, SOD, comma 2 symmetry dramatically constrains the physics of the, the fixed points. So this is the uh, main ingredient in the conformal bootstrap. But uh, uh, it, in fact, it also tells us non-trivial things about the flow. OK. So as I already said before, the qualitative picture of the renormalization group that I very briefly reviewed for you is deeply rooted in our intuition that heavy or short distance degrees of freedom decouple at long distances. And this is tantamount to the statement that the RG flow is an irreversible flow. And we would like to make this more precise in quantum field theory. And in order to do that, we need a way to count those degrees of freedom that is well-defined in the continuum and doesn't suffer from the scheme ambiguities that the various naive counting functions did. Uh, if you think of free or weakly coupled theories, you might imagine that something simple you could do is just count the number of free fields in the Lagrangian. Um, but, but it's pretty easy to convince yourself that this is not a good idea. It's generally not very well defined. And moreover, we would like to also explore strongly coupled theories or flows. So a very fruitful approach that has um, been central to this way of thinking uh, for, for several decades is to look for what I will call a counting function, or a C function for short. This is not the historical origin of the name C function, but that's the meaning I will ascribe to it. And in order to be a sensible counting function, we will demand that it satisfies certain nice properties. So one thing we could demand is that it's a nice dimensionful, dimensionless function of the energy scale, C of E, which decreases monotonically along the RG flow from the UV to the infrared. So its first derivative with respect to energy is positive, which means it's smaller at low energies than it is at high energies. Um, a slightly weaker statement, which follows from the first one, is that we can assign asymptotic numbers, C ultraviolet and C infrared, to the fixed points at uh, high and low energies, such that the high energy C is, is bigger than the low energy C. Uh, these two statements, 1S and 1W, are sometimes called uh, strong and weak C theorems, respectively. And another thing we would like to demand in order to have this counting intuition be sensible is that in a unitary theory, all of these C functions should be non-negative. So the classic example, the gold standard for a C function was written down by Samologikov uh, several decades ago. And he constructed in two dimensions a universal C function from the two-point correlation function of the stress tensor in Euclidean flat space. 
So c of x squared is some function of the Euclidean distance squared, which is related to the energy scale like this. And it's uh, related to some linear combination of the various two-point function coefficients in the stress tensor correlator. Uh, and uh, and uh, he showed that its first derivative with respect to distance is proportional to minus the two-point correlation function of the trace. And, uh, and uh, by reflection positivity or, or Euclidean unitarity, this correlation function is negative in uh, unitary theories, and therefore this first derivative is also negative, which means that the C function decreases from short distances to long distances. So we are, this is actually a strong C function that satisfies property 1s on the previous slide. And the way to show this is uh, very elementary. You just use the ward identities of Lorentz invariance, stress tensor conservation, and as I have already mentioned, uh, reflection positivity. So let me uh, briefly summarize a few properties of the C function. First of all, um, if you assume that you have a scale invariant uh, part of the RG flow, then by dimensional analysis, you can argue that uh, the first derivative of C should vanish there. Um, and then, by using this equation, you conclude that the trace of the stress tensor is actually zero there. Because if this two-point function is zero, then the trace of T must be zero as an operator. And this is enough to guarantee that the fixed point is actually a conformal field theory. So this is an argument due to Polchinski. Um, and moreover, if the C function itself vanishes, then it turns out that the stress tensor itself has to vanish as an operator, and that can only happen in a topological field theory without any local degrees of freedom. Another uh, property of the C function that you can immediately derive from these formulas is that it should be uh, independent under exactly marginal deformations of a conformal fixed point. Roughly speaking, because such deformations preserve the tracelessness of the stress tensor, so this would vanish, and therefore C has to be constant along such deformations. And this turns out to be a property that will pop up again in, in other dimensions, and, and I wanted to mention it here. Right. Now, I've already said that the positivity of the uh, trace correlator implies that C prime is negative, uh, and this means that the C function is strictly decreasing. And when you have such a strictly decreasing function along the RG flow, it means that that flow cannot have recurrent or cyclic behaviors, like the limit cycles that I uh, drew on the, some of the previous slides. So it already constrains the flow. And the last comment I wanted to make about it is that you can re-express this function of distance as a height function, C of G sub i, on theory space, on the space of coupling constants. Uh, and in fact, these authors showed that this height function is a gradient potential for the RG flow. So the, the RG flow is a, is a gradient flow, and C is the appropriate potential. Now, at conformal fixed points, uh, we said that theory had to be conformal, and that means it has Verasoro symmetry with some central charge C sub Verasoro, which is proportional to the C function that I wrote down on the previous slide. And this number, C sub Verasoro, as many of you know, shows up in many, many different physical observables in two-dimensional conformal field theories, not just the two-point function of stress tensors. So I'm going to briefly mention these because they'll also recur in other dimensions. For instance, the uh, infinite volume finite tem temperature-free energy uh, is proportional to this combination of the temperature and the volume, uh, and the proportionality coefficient is governed by C sub Verasoro. And similarly, the Casimir energy and the spectral asymptotics on a circle uh, is governed by the same C sub Verasoro, as shown by Cardi. Uh, an in interpretation that will be crucial in a little bit will be that uh, C also controls the trace anomaly. The trace anomaly can be defined by examining the trace of the stress tensor which is zero in flat space, when you turn on a non-trivial uh, background metric, little g. And then that trace that develops a C number right-hand side, which is proportional to the Ricci scalar curvature of the metric, and the proportionality coefficient is again C. Uh, and just from this formula, you can convince yourself that the logarithm of the S2 partition function uh, has to contain a term that actually knows about the logarithm of the, of the radius of the sphere uh, with coefficient given by C. Uh, and the fact that this logarithm of the radius appears explicitly manifests the, the anomaly because 
naively, the radius shouldn't have appeared in a conformal theory. Uh, and finally, the last interpretation, which will also be crucial, is in terms of vacuum entanglement. So if you uh, split up the Hilbert space of a uh, one plus one dimensional CFT like this by simply cutting out an interval of length A, uh, and you imagine that the Hilbert space factorizes into the Hilbert space living in the region A and its complement, uh, then uh, the reduced density matrix corresponding to that um, factorization is an interesting object, and the corresponding von Neumann entropy or entanglement entropy, which is defined like this, um, also scales like the logarithm of the length of the interval with coefficient c. So all these are useful ways of thinking about c in two dimensions. Now, I, I would like to use the last point of view in terms of entanglement to give a second proof of the two-dimensional C theorem uh, due to Cassini and Huerta. So at fixed points, we said that the uh, single interval entanglement entropy scales like the logarithm of L with coefficient C, and both the log lambda piece, which is the UV divergent part, and this constant here are scheme dependent, so we would like to somehow get rid of them. And one way to do that is to define what you and Mazet called renormalized entanglement entropy. We just take this uh, first derivative of S, uh, and we call it C of L, and you see by this formula that this is simply proportional to the constant uh, C sub zero, zero at fixed points, but it is generally believed that this C sub L defines a scheme-independent, well-defined uh, object even away from fixed points. And uh, in fact, Cassini and Huerta showed that it defines a C function. So in order to show that, you again need the same ingredients as before. You need unitarity, you need Lorentz invariance, and you need in some slightly hidden way some notion of locality, which was obvious in the uh, correlation function approach. Here it's hiding in the fact that the various divergences that show up in the bare entanglement entropy actually cancel nicely in this C function. Um, and unitarity implies, among many other things, uh, that the entanglement entropy S satisfies strong subadditivity, which is an inequality of this type. So this is a little bit of a mouthful. Uh, the regions that this inequality will apply to are uh, drawn down here. This is a light cone in two dimensions, and there are four points on the light cone, W, X, Y, and Z, and there are many different intervals um, that we could consider. The intervals that I would like to consider is, are, are uh, shown here, and, and strong subadditivity says that uh, these combinations of entanglement entropies satisfy an inequality of this type. So by WX, for instance, I mean the interval connecting W and X, and the union of these two is just the union of these two intervals. Good. So uh, this is what strong subadditivity says. Another statement that we need, which follows from causality, is that the entanglement entropy does not depend on the Cauchy slice you choose. So for example, you can replace the union of WX and XY simply by the interval WY. And the same for these two intervals, which can be replaced by this diagonal. Um, and when you do that and write it out, you get an interesting inequality. That inequality is complicated for finite epsilon, where epsilon is this height. But when epsilon goes to zero, it turns into a nice differential equation for S, which I've written here. This is the differential equation for S that it implies. And if you use the definition of this renormalized entanglement entropy up here, that simply says that the first derivative of the C function uh, with respect to length is negative, which is what you need for the C theorem. Uh, good. I would also like to mention that strong subadditivity can be used to show that the C function is positive. Uh, now we've uh, now seen two examples of C functions, uh, one based on the stress tensor two-point function and one based on entanglement, and they're different. Uh, so I would briefly like to comment on the differences by using examples of free massive scalars and Dirac fermions. Uh, and the different C functions are plotted here. The solid curves up here are the uh, st stress tensor C functions for the scalar and the Dirac fermion. You see that they're nice and analytic at the endpoints and decay exponentially at long distances, uh, and in particular, they're stationary here near the UV. First derivative vanishes. The entanglement-based C functions are slightly more singular in the UV. So the one for the Dirac fermion uh, has, uh, you know, is also stationary, but, but has some non-analyticity, even at short distances. And the one for the scalar actually has a cusp, so that its first derivative blows up in the UV. Um, and in fact, this behavior is quite generic and expected 
for these entanglement-based C functions in different dimensions. Good. So the analysis of the 2D case suggests that C functions are abundant and rich and easy to find and perhaps even easy to analyze. And this turns out not to be the case historically. Uh, part of that is because many natural candidates for how to define C functions in higher dimensions are in fact not C functions. So for example, if you try to use the two-point function of the stress tensor or its spin-two projection, uh, you can show explicitly using techniques from supersymmetry that there are RG flows along which this uh, two-point function coefficient actually grows. And similarly, you might try to use the dimensionless coefficient that governs the thermal free energy, the Stefan Boltzmann constant, to uh, define the degrees of freedom in higher dimensions. And in fact, that can also decrease under some RG flows, uh, both in three dimensions and in four dimensions. Uh, moreover, the Stefan Boltzmann constant can depend on exactly marginal couplings. So a famous example is uh, 4D n equals to 4 super Yang Mills theory in the large n limit, uh, where it was shown uh, using holography that the infinite coupling and the, the free limits uh, differ by this famous factor of three quarters. Um, a similar statement is in principle possible for the two-point function of the stress tensor. It's not known whether it can depend on marginal couplings or not. But uh, the reason it's not known is that we don't have any examples uh, of theories with marginal couplings that are not supersymmetric. But supersymmetry, in fact, implies that CT cannot depend on marginal couplings. Nevertheless, this possibility exists. So in the absence of these more intuitive generalizations to higher dimensions, we need to go to a slightly less intuitive uh, generalization, and this was provided by Cardi. Um, what he looked at was the trace anomaly in any even dimension D. So the trace anomaly, as before, is the expectation value of the stress tensor in a background metric. And in general, even dimensions, it contains a number of different terms. So there's always one universal Euler term, which is proportional to the Euler density uh, in D dimensions. This is some combination of D over two Riemann tensors contracted in such a way that it integrates to the Euler characteristic, and the anomaly coefficient A uh, is, uh, is unique. And then there are typically many different vial anomalies with coefficient C that, uh, um, wh whose number depends on the dimension you're in. And in addition, the trace anomaly could have various scheme-dependent pieces. Now, because there are D over two stress tensors here, you can see that the A anomaly resides in a D over two plus one point function of stress tensors in flat space. So you have to keep looking at higher and higher point functions in higher and higher dimensions. And just like in two dimensions, it shows up in the sphere partition function uh, as well as a uh, anomalous uh, radius dependent piece proportional to this logarithm of R with a very specific sign. And in addition to this universal piece proportional to A, there are many uh, scheme dependent pieces which may or may not be divergent, uh, which come in all even powers of the radius uh, with uh, appropriate powers of the cutoff inserted. These come from local counter terms of this, of this form on the sphere. And as I've said before, there are generally multiple C anomalies and the only exception is two dimensions where there's no C anomaly. And in fact, what I called A here coincides with the Virasoro central charge because the 2D Euler density is proportional to the Ricci scalar. So based on various pieces of evidence that I'll review uh, in, in a second, Cardi conjectured that the A anomaly should satisfy this inequality. Uh, and uh, this inequality is generally known as the A theorem, uh, regardless of whether it's been proven or not. Um, so in the previous terminology, this would be a weak A theorem. And as I said before, we also expect that in nice unitary theories, A should be positive. So both statements have been proven in two and four dimensions, and there are partial results for supersymmetric theories in six dimensions. Now, so far we've only discussed even dimensions, so one might wonder what happens in odd dimensions. Um, a universal conjecture was arrived at by considering the uh, vacuum entanglement entropy uh, across a round sphere, D minus two dimensional sphere of radius R in uh, D dimensions. And um, just like the sphere-free energy, the, this entanglement entropy has various divergences corresponding to all uh, powers of R that differ from the space-time dimension by two. Uh, I'll explain where that comes from in, in a second. And then there's a universal scheme independent piece that is either some dimensionless number times a logarithm of R in even dimensions 
or just a pure number in odd dimensions. And I'll call that scheme independent piece little s in both cases. Um, I should say that the first leading divergence is the famous area term in the entanglement entropy. And this uh, divergence structure is expected uh, as long as you use a sufficiently diff invariant regulator because um, it's predicted that uh, the divergences in entanglement being short distance and local should be proportional to uh, local integrals of extrinsic curvature invariance of the entangling surface. So you should get uh, integrals of powers of the extrinsic cur curvature which scale like that um, and then you have to use the fact that you're looking at this in a pure state, namely the vacuum, to rule out odd powers of n. Now, uh, Myers and Sinha analyzed the behavior of um, this uh, entanglement entropy under holographic RG flows in higher curvature gravity theories, uh, which are more generic than, than pure Einstein gravity. And they always found that uh, this coefficient little s, this universal coefficient little, little s, satisfies uh, a C theorem like inequality. So they conjectured that it's universally true. And uh, in fact, they also showed that in even dimensions, this little s coincides with the A anomaly. So, uh, uh, so in fact, it subsumes Cardi's A, A conjecture. And in odd dimensions, uh, these authors showed that the universal entropy little s is in fact proportional to what I will call big F, which is the scheme independent part of the sphere partition function in odd dimensions. So just like in even dimensions, the logarithm of the sphere partition function contains a bunch of diversion pieces, uh, importantly here only containing odd powers of R, and a pure number F with some sign that is judiciously chosen, which is a pure number and, and scheme independent. Um, and independently of, of um, the work based on entanglement, um, these authors uh, conjectured that this coefficient of the sphere partition function uh, also satisfies a, a C theorem, or in this case it's called an F theorem. Um, and uh, proofs are available for that in three dimensions. I will also briefly review them shortly. Um, and I should say that also in all known examples, this uh, quantity F is non-negative, and of course we expect it to be true in general, but there's no proof for that. So before I go through and review some of the evidence for these different conjectures in different dimensions, uh, let me just mention that there's some uniform evidence that, that works equally well in, in all dimensions. So there's the holographic evidence collected by Myers and Sinha and Cassini, Huerta Myers, and many, many other authors. Um, and also, uh, you can show that these quantities decrease under weakly relevant flows, where you're perturbed by an operator that is just barely relevant. And the uh, last comment is that all of these C functions on this slide, so this universal entanglement piece, the A anomaly, and the sphere partition function are invariant under exactly marginal deformations. Uh, in the sphere partition function picture, that's essentially due to the fact that when you take a variation with respect to the marginal coupling, you insert a one-point function of the deforming operator on the sphere, and that should be zero. Uh, that's correct in odd dimensions. It's slightly imprecise in even dimensions but there you can use the Wesumino consistency conditions to show that the A anomaly is also invariant. So in the second half of the talk, I'm going to review the proofs and, and the evidence for these various theorems in different dimensions, but before I delve into that, I wanted to give one example of how you can actually use uh, one of these C theorems to learn something about dynamics. Um, so uh, I'm gonna give an example of how they would give a constraint on, for example, phase diagrams of interesting theories. And we heard about phase diagrams in the talk by Cyborg yesterday. Uh, the example will be three-dimensional QED, which is a U1 gauge theory with an even number, 2NF, of two component fermions of charge one. And that theory has a flavor symmetry, which is SU2NF times the U1 topological associated with the gauge field. And we know that for sufficiently many flavors, uh, below, uh, above some critical number N, subflavor star, uh, this theory is in a conformal window. It's, it flows to a CFT, essentially because for large enough, we can use perturbation theory to show that such a fixed point exists. For smaller values of n, uh, we don't, we're not completely sure what happens, but there's a very plausible scenario advocated by many, many people over the years that the flavor symmetry could break in the following pattern, uh, leaving a, a total number of two NF squared number Goldstone bosons in the infrared, as well as the dual photon. And by considering uh, an RG flow from the conformal window to this broken phase with number Goldstone bosons, uh, and, I and, by, and applying the, the F theorem, 
to this flow, which looks like that in this example, um, you can constrain uh, the critical number of flavors, n star. So uh, various authors looked at this and came up with the following constraint, which is that n star of sub f should be less than or equal to 5. Um, now, recent arguments based on duality web webs suggest that the number is actually much lower. They, they suggest that nf star is actually 1, uh, which is just a statement that QED, even with one flavor, flows to a conformal field theory. So the bound is not very tight, but it's, you know, one order of magnitude or so correct. There are other examples where the bound is much weaker. For example, uh, you, you don't learn anything about the conformal window in QCD by playing this game. Let me um, start reviewing the proofs for the various A theorems in the different dimensions where they exist, starting with four dimensions, um, proceeding quasi-historically. Um, so uh, there was some important early evidence in perturbation theory amassed by various authors, notably Osborne. Um, and then there was very strong evidence for the truth of the A theorem coming from supersymmetry. Because with supersymmetry, there's a formula for the A anomaly in terms of a Toft anomalies for the U1R symmetry. So I'm imagining that we're discussing n equals to 1 theories in four dimensions. And then A is a linear combination of the cubic R symmetry anomaly and the mixed R symmetry gravitational anomaly. And um, that makes the A anomaly eminently computable as long as you know the U1R uh, symmetry that you are talking about. And that can often be found by a procedure known as A maximization. And these various technical tools led to many, many checks that delta A is positive in supersymmetric RG flows. So very convincing evidence, including strongly coupled evidence that, that the A theorem is, is true. Uh, another statement that has been proven is that the A anomaly is bounded from below by the two-point function of the stress tensor, C sub T. Uh, this is a non-trivial statement because in four dimensions, the A anomaly first appears in a three-point function, which doesn't have any obvious positivity properties. Uh, but in fact, Hoffman and Malasena argued that um, uh, this positivity condition can be thought of as the positivity of a certain energy flux at null infinity. And uh, more recently, this can be phrased in the language of the uh, average null energy condition. And in fact, both the direct proof of the hoffman maldus bounds and the proof of the uh, average null energy condition has been put forth recently by three different groups using three completely different methods based on bootstrap and uh, entanglement and uh, causality. So the general proof of the A theorem due to Komargatsky and Schwimmer uh, depends on a few ingredients, which I'll now briefly review. So first of all, I'm imagining that we're starting in the UV with a conformal field theory for now. And I'm imagining that it has a moduli space of vacua, uh, where uh, if you turn on a, a vacuum expectation value to, to flow onto that moduli space, then conformal symmetry will be spontaneously broken. And that spontaneous breaking means that uh, in the deep infrared, it is mandatory to find a nearly free massless scalar nambu goldstone boson, which for historical reasons is called the dilaton. And like any goldstone boson, it very weakly interacts with itself through irrelevant operators. And it might also weakly interact with other degrees of freedom in the infrared, which assemble themselves into a infrared CFT. So the flow I'm Im imagining is that fl flowing from the UV, which is roughly speaking the theory at the origin of moduli space, to the deep infrared, where you have the dilaton and whatever is left over in the infrared. And delta A is this quantity here. And I'm including the A anomaly of the dilaton because it's a physical propagating field in the infrared. Now, an important point, which was emphasized by Schwimmer and Tyson, was that the A anomaly must match between the UV and the infrared, just like any other Hooft anomaly. Um, and that leads to the statement that the anomaly mismatch delta A, which we would like to prove is positive, is compensated in some way by a Wesumino-like term in the dilaton Lagrangian. I'll give more details in a second, but this is very typical of at least certain types of anomaly matching with number Goldstone bosons. So the uh, low energy effective action of the dilaton looks like this. There's a nice kinetic term for the dilaton, and the other terms are strongly constrained by the non-linearly realized conformal symmetry that acts on phi. And there's a systematic procedure for classifying all of these terms based on the broken conformal symmetry. There are higher order terms here, which will not be important for the argument, which can include 
higher derivative self-couplings of the dilaton and higher, higher order couplings between the dilaton and any other infrared degrees of freedom, the important coupling for us will be this four derivative coupling, which is the leading inter self-interaction of the dilaton. And this is precisely the wes Zumino term for the conformal symmetry for the A anomaly. And for this reason, its coefficient is fixed to be delta A. And because it's the leading four-point interaction for, dilaton, uh, for the dilaton, um, it is strongly constrained by causality or unitarity in the form of, for instance, dispersion relations on the four dilaton scattering amplitude, as explained by these authors. And th those arguments imply that the coefficient delta A has to be positive. So that establishes the A theorem. And uh, you can think of the four dilaton scattering as probing the correlation function of four traces of the stress tensor, because the dilaton couples to the trace of the stress tensor and nothing else. Uh, but because we're considering on-shell dilaton scattering, we're looking at this correlation function only in the on-shell light-like limit, where all the momenta uh, square to zero. And I should emphasize that here I'm very much in Lorentzian signature, uh, unlike in, say, the two-dimensional Zamolodzikov argument. Uh, finally, of course, we would like to consider our G flows that are initiated by relevant couplings, which break the conformal symmetry explicitly. And uh, in that case, it's possible to convert, at least in a formal sense, spontaneous breaking, uh, sorry, explicit breaking into spontaneous breaking by introducing the dilaton not as a propagating field, but as a non-dynamical background field. It's often called a spurion or a compensator field as well. And you tune the couplings of the dilaton in such a way that the combined dilaton uh, uh, and dynamical system respects uh, formally the conformal symmetry. So the argument can be repeated in that language. Good, so that was all I was going to say about the 4DA theorem. Um, but in all of that discussion, I implicitly assumed that the UV and IR asymptotics are given by conformal field theories. And remember that I said that it wasn't obvious that this was the case. In two dimensions, there was uh, a strong argument that scale invariance implied that the stress, uh, stress tensor is traceless which is sufficient for conformal invariance. Um, but this, in fact, is too strong in higher dimensions, roughly speaking due to the existence of what are called improvements. If you have one, tr one stress tensor, then uh, an equally good stress tensor can be obtained by adding to it the following derivative operator acting on a scalar of dimension d minus 2. And these are equally good stress tensors from every possible point of view, except if, even if t is traceless, then t prime will not be traceless. It will be proportional to uh, d squared acting on the operator O. So, in fact, it's perfectly sufficient for conformal symmetry that the trace of the stress tensor is d squared of a, of a scalar O. And there's no hope of proving that that has to be zero on completely general grounds. Now, in perturbation theory, many, many authors have done uh, beautiful work showing that this relation is satisfied as long as the flow is perturbative and the beta functions are small. Beyond perturbation theory, uh, there were two papers that established the following vanishing of a certain matrix element. Uh, this is a matrix element of uh, any number of traces of the stress tensor between the vacuum and any state in the theory. But the restriction is that this matrix element was only shown to vanish for light-like on-shell momenta. If this were to vanish for any momenta, then of course it would imply that T is zero as an operator. But we already said that that was too strong. Instead, it only vi uh, vanishes on-shell. But roughly speaking, what this means is that if you interpret this as a dilaton S matrix element, then the dilaton S matrix is trivial. Uh, so that means that uh, this coupling between the dilaton and the stress tensor has to effectively vanish on shell so in, in order not to produce a non-trivial S matrix. And roughly speaking, uh, modulo some caveats, this is thought to imply that the trace of T is in fact D squared of a scalar. You can see that if that is true and you substitute into this interaction, then you can integrate by parts, and you get d squared on phi, so that if you go on shell for the dilaton, this interaction vanishes. And I want to say also that there are no such results in dimensions other than 2 and 4. Uh, and in fact, in, say, odd dimensions, there are um, slightly confusing counterexamples, like free Maxwell theory, which is scale invariant, but not conformally invariant. I'm not now going to switch gears and talk about the F theorem in 3D. Recall that one way to think about F was as the universal constant piece in the uh, S3 partition function, or the logarithm of the S3 partition function. Um, 
And I said that in all known examples, f turned out, turns out to be positive, but we don't know of a general proof, uh, except in topological field theories. In topological field theories, f uh, is minus the logarithm of S00, the top left matrix element of the modular S matrix. Uh, and if, since that's a unitary mat matrix, uh, this logarithm has to be negative, and therefore S has to be positive. And this quantity F in topological field theories precisely coincides with the topological entanglement entropy of Kitaev, Freskill, and Levin, Wen. Uh, and that means that it's a non-local quantity. You cannot extract it by studying stress tensor correlation functions in flat space. For example, in pure U1 level K churn simons theory, this F quantity is proportional to log K. So not only is it non-zero, but it's arbitrarily big. Now, um, strong evidence for the F theorem came from studying uh, theories in three dimensions with n equals two supersymmetry and our G flows between them that preserve a U on R symmetry. In those theories, F can be computed exactly, even in strongly coupled theories using localization techniques uh, pioneered by these authors, and a, a, a something called F maximization, which is roughly speaking the three-dimensional analog of A maximization. Uh, and those techniques were used to check this inequality in many, many examples uh, and prove it for large classes of examples. And one comment that I want to make before going to the only proof of the F theorem that we know is that um, if you believe that this inequality is true, you immediately conclude that F of a free Maxwell theory has to be infinite. It cannot possibly be any finite number because you can consider a flow from free Maxwell theory to U1 level K and Simons theory in the infrared, but that has unbounded F for large K. And therefore, the only consistent assignment for Maxwell theory is infinity. Uh, this is not coincidental. It's closely related to the comment I made on the previous slide, which was that uh, Maxwell theory in three dimensions is not, in fact, a conformal field theory. The only proofs we know of the F theorem in three dimensions uh, involve the entanglement entropy techniques pioneered by Cassini and Huerta. Uh, we do not have a, say, a dilaton-based proof or a proof based on correlation functions. Uh, so now I'm going to briefly review their argument. So remember that the goal was to show that a particular renormalized quantity, the renormalized entanglement entropy, was decreasing along RG flows. And in three dimensions, the correct renormalized entanglement entropy, F of R, is this particular combination of R and derivatives of S. This combination ensures that the uh, scheme-dependent pieces drop out, and you're only left with a universal constant, for instance, at fixed points. However, we're going to w still work in terms of the bare entanglement entropy because it satisfies various nice properties. So S of R is the bare entanglement entropy across a circle of radius R, including divergences. And we're going to try and go, go through their argument mimicking what they did in two dimensions. Okay, so we're going to try to use strong subadditivity, which follows from unitarity, uh, but, and we're going to apply it to uh, regions that are a little more complicated than in the two-dimensional case. Uh, I'll explain that picture in just a second. Um, the regions we're considering involve n uniformly spaced circles, which I'll call x sub i, where i runs from 1 to n. And these are circles that lie on a null cone. So these are these black ellipses. These are projected circles on the null cone, and they're evenly spaced around the axis of the cone. Uh, and we uh, choose it so that the radius of those boosted circles is square root of little r times big R. And then if you apply strong subadditivity to those circles, you get an inequality of this form, uh, which is a, quite a mouthful. Uh, so on the left, you just get the sum of the entropies of all the boosted circles. On the right, you get contributions from many different uh, regions. Uh, and a generic such region uh, looks like uh, this kind of jagged sawtooth type circle lying on the, on the null cone. Um, and roughly speaking, the, you can think of the sort of region as being uh, enveloped by a circle of radius big R and a circle of radi radius little r, which lies up here. Uh, and the hope is that if capital N goes to infinity, then all of these jagged features will smooth out and the entanglement entropy of all the jagged circles will reduce to that of a round circle of radius that can lie anywhere between little r and big R. Uh, so if this, ho if this hope is, uh, materializes, then you get a nice inequality in the limit where the difference between big R and little r, which I called epsilon, uh, 
goes to zero, and it's a nice differential inequality just like in two dimensions. So in this case, it reads uh, S double prime of R is negative. And then going back to the definition of the renormalized entanglement entropy sub F up here, you see that the first derivative of F is just R times the second deriv derivative and is therefore also negative. So F prime is negative, and that means that F decreases from short to long distances, and this proves the F theorem in three dimensions. Um, now, the worry with this argument was that we were persistently manipulating divergent quantities. We were manipulating the bare S, and we had to worry that the various infinities might not cancel out due to these various sawtooth features and so forth. So in three dimensions, it can be argued that that doesn't happen. But um, if you try to generalize this argument verbatim to higher dimensions, uh, then this will come home with a vengeance, uh, and, and this uh, obstructed the proof of the higher dimensional A theorem using these arguments for a while, but there was a um, very nice paper recently which rectified the situation. Um, they generalized this argument to give a different four-dimensional proof of the A theorem, uh, and what they did is they regulated all the potentially worrisome singularities by applying strong subadditivity not to the bare entropy, but to the bare entropy minus the entropy that you would have computed in the UVCFT. And uh, the hope is that in this difference, all the various divergences coming from the corners and the short distance features will cancel out, uh, and the continuum limit will be better. Uh, the worry is that because you're subtracting an entropy, you might break strong subadditivity. And in fact, the reason this works uh, is that uh, the quantity S in a uh, CFT was shown by these authors to not just satisfy strong subadditivity, but actually saturate it. So for that, it's an equality, not just an inequality, and you can subtract it without penalty. I should also say that it's not, doesn't seem possible at the moment to use this argument to get a C theorem in more than four dimensions, uh, because strong subadditivity always gives second order differential equations for S, and it seems like you need higher derivative of S in more dimensions to get to the scheme independent part of the renormalized entanglement entropy. Okay, so so far I've only considered uh, RG flows of quantum field theories in infinite flat space. Uh, I want to just very briefly flash some comments about finite volume flows with suitable boundary conditions. For example, 2D conformal field theories on an interval on, of finite length L. The uh, thermal partition function not only contains the universal bulk piece, but also a boundary piece called log of G. And in the conformal field theory, this is just a pure number. And uh, it was shown by these authors that if you perturb the system by a relevant boundary operator while keeping the bulk theory fixed, then G evolves along the renormalization group flow in a monotonic way. So GUV is bigger than GIR. This is a classic result in uh, one plus one dimensions with boundary. And I just wanted to say that there are various recent generalizations of these boundary C theorems to higher dimensions. Um, and finally, I want to make a few brief comments about RG flows and C theorems in higher dimensions. Um, we don't know of any interacting uh, bosonic conformal field theories in more than four dimensions, and it's not really clear why. But what we do know is that there is a rich zoo of interacting superconformal field theories, at least in dimension five and six. Uh, and even though their um, existence is indirectly inferred by string theory and they don't have a Lagrangian, we believe that they're quantum field theories. So uh, I'll refer you to the talk by Kim uh, that will review these theories in some detail. Uh, but I would like to ask very briefly whether we can understand the RG flows in these theories and say something about C theorems. So in five dimensions, the status of the C theorem is uh, very open. Uh, Jaffers and Pufu verified it for a few in, uh, flows between special CFTs, um, and they did that by localizing the S5 partition fu function in a particularly tractable limit. Uh, so there are some examples where it's been checked. There's certainly no general proof even for supersymmetric flows, and there's no argument that F should be positive, even at superconformal or conformal fixed points. And in fact, there's a pesky example which seems to ruin all hopes for positivity, which is that just like in Maxwell theory in three dimensions, F was infinitely positive. Here, it's infinitely negative, um, at least in any reasonable interpretation that we know of. And so this seems to A, trivialize this inequality, and B, ruin the interpretation in terms of degrees of freedom counting, and you might think that this never happens, but in fact it happens in many, many supersymmetric flows.
So in six dimensions, um, the status of the A theorem is a little bit better. These authors showed that the uh, dilaton effect of action has to take this form. Um, there are four derivative interactions and six derivative interactions. Now the four derivative interactions with coefficients b uh, are not related to the West Domino term at six derivatives with coefficient delta a. Um, and we don't know of any general constraint on low energy effective actions that would prove that delta a is positive. And roughly speaking, very intuitively, this is because b dominates all low energy calculations, as it should. Um, you can focus on theories with one zero supersymmetry and their RG flows to make a little bit of progress. Uh, and you can examine the RG flow starting from a UV CFT with, with supersymmetry. And the first thing you notice is that there are no SUSY preserving relevant operators. So the only RG flows you can even consider are flows onto the moduli space where the dilaton is an actual physical Goldstone boson. Um, and in fact, for such flows, uh, at least for certain branches of the moduli space, you can show that supersymmetry implies that the delta A coefficient is quadratically related to this other pesky coefficient B. And therefore, it's trivially positive and satisfies the A theorem. Uh, and even though it's true for all 1, 0 theories, this relation was first noticed in 2, 0 theories. And uh, you can use this approach to the dilaton effective action to learn more. You can turn on supergravity background fields to show that these coefficients are in fact related to certain Green-Schwartz terms for matching R symmetry and gravitational Hoft anomalies on the moduli space. And this leads to a quantitative formula for A in terms of these anomalies, just like in four dimensions. I should still state, emphasize that there's no general proof that A is positive either in six dimensions, uh, but using uh, similar arguments as uh, up here on the slide, you can show that it's true in supersymmetric theories with tensor branches. So I'm nearly done. Um, I've focused on a particular set of ideas revolving around a particular nice class of C functions in different dimensions. And before wrapping up, I just wanted to flash two interesting proposals that fall out of this class. One involves the Stefan Boltzmann constant in the thermal free energy in arbitrary dimension. And recall that I said it wasn't a good general C function because there are examples where it's known to increase under RG flow. But in fact, all known counterexamples involve a UV CFT that is interacting. And so it might still be true that it's, uh, the inequality is obeyed if the UV theory is free. Uh, it's not clear whether that's true, but if you believe it, then, for example, it gives a tighter bound on the conformal window of 3D QED than the one you get from the F theorem. And finally, I just wanted to, to briefly mention that Kukov has been using global methods to argue for various interesting inequalities uh, between, say, the number of relevant operators at the UV and R fixed points and... Uh, and um, that should also be investigated further. So I will end, instead of giving you a set of conclusions with this table, which summarizes the various possible properties of uh, flows and, and uh, limits in the different dimensions, and uh, just you know, to explain a little bit, the first statement is the weak, th weak C theorem. The second statement is the statement that C is positive at fixed points. This is the strong C theorem, and this is the statement that there's an interpolating positive C function. Um, this is the statement that scale invariance implies conformal invariance, and this is the statement that the RG flow is, in some sense, a gradient flow. So all of these statements are known to be true in 2D, and I've summarized here what the status is in higher dimensions, as I've reviewed in this talk, and I hope very much, and I expect that some of these entries will be filled in by strings 2018. So thank you very much for your attention. Questions? I yeah, you mentioned the value of f for topological field theories in three dimensions. What, what about topological field theories in other dimensions? Um, well, in four dimensions, or in indeed any even dimension, the A is given by a stress tensor correlator, so it vanishes in topological field theories. I know nothing about topological field theories in five dimensions, uh, except maybe uh, Z and gauge theories, uh, which presumably contribute to this F, but I'm not 100% sure. Is there no, no further questions? Oh,
He stated there are no known non-supersymmetric uh, fixed points in five dimensions. I'm curious about whether, uh, just as in 4D, there's an epsilon expansion for uh, the Ising model. It seems naively that there should be in uh, four plus epsilon dimension a epsilon expansion for a uh, gauge model with a negative beta function, just from the fact that you get a fixed point naively in perturbation theory from the negative beta function and the epsilon correction uh, for the gauge coupling in higher than four dimensions. Is that a theory that's known to be conformal or does it just not come to a fixed point in 5D? Uh, so the short answer is that I know very little about it. There, there, there have been, has been quite a lot of work on trying to use epsilon expansions in higher dimensions to look, search for, for fixed points uh, by Klabanov and John being collaborators and, and many other people that, that I'm sure uh, are here. But um, I, I don't know of any convincing or, or, or slam dunk result that a, that a fixed point in five dimensions actually exists. Um. What is the meaning of this fact that uh, in three dimension f of Maxwell theory is infinity and in five dimensions is minus infinity? Does it mean that this concept is wrong or what? Uh, well, um, I think in three dimensions, it's, uh, you know, it looks odd, but it's, very, it's totally consistent with everything. You know, there are nice RG flows where consistency forces you into that situation. Um, you, might meet, you might ask whether it means that you should think of that theory as having infinitely many degrees of freedom, and then perhaps you can extract them by coupling Maxwell theory to other degrees of freedom in some nice way. So, for example, you might imagine that you could couple, couple Maxwell theory to one matter field, and then you have some interesting flow, and you get... 20,000 matter fields out in the infrared. There's no example of such a flow, but it's in principle allowed by the F theorem. Uh, in five dimensions, I'm not sure what it means, but one possible interpretation uh, is that, roughly speaking, any theory can flow to a free gauge theory in the infrared. Um, so, so uh, in, in uh, so in, in non-relativistic theories, this intuition of integrating stuff out and decreasing number of degree, degrees of freedom, in some sense, is still true. But we, it seems that Lorentz and important part of defining and proving these uh, C theorems. So, it, uh, it, does that mean they're not really capturing this d intuition of integrating out degrees of freedom, or somehow, what, why is Lorentz invariant so important? Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, I think uh, there, there are two comments I want to make. First of all, it's true that these strong results require Lorentz invariance, and there are, for example, examples of RG flows with limit cycles and other funny features without, without Lorentz invariance. I think the intuition about the degrees of freedom being thinned out is the naive one that I presented at the very beginning, where you have, have in mind the bare lattice degree of freedom that you start with. And, and for those, it's unambiguously true. The, the uh, bait and switch is that we have to instead talk about these renormalized quantities where we subtract all the infinities and and the intuition is, is uh, much more suspect. Uh, so in some sense, these results re partially restore that intuition, but I guess there was no guarantee that it had to happen. Okay, let's thank the speaker again.